Welcome to the Stoa. The Stoa is a digital campfire where we cohere and dialogue about what matters most at the knife's edge of what's happening now. All right, everyone. Welcome to the first session of the Stoa. I am Peter Limberg, and some of you may know I'm a practicing Stoic and run the Stoic group here in Toronto, Canada. We obviously can't meet in person right now, so I've launched the Stoa, uh, which is a place I see where we can gather around the digital campfire and discuss what matters most at the knife's edge of this moment. Um, in a moment, Jordan Hall is going to give a situational assessment. I may have some questions afterwards, and then um, we'll open up for a group dialogue. And how the group dialogue will work, if you have a question, just write it down in the chat box, and I'll call on you. Uh, just unmute yourself, or if you want me to read your question, just indicate that when you write it down. Um, and then just keep it nice and crisp, because we have a lot of people in the chat, and we probably won't get to everyone's question. So with that being said, let me unmute Jordan. Jordan, are you here? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Beautiful. Um, so Jordan, I'll hand it to you, my friend. Uh, what's the, the situation? Um, Peter, can I assume that everybody's read my medium piece or should I be recapitulating some of that? Um, I do not know. Uh, that's a good question. Maybe people in the chat box can just say you've read it. Um, so the opposite. If you haven't read it, please give the signal. If you get a critical mass, then we'll have to recapitulate it. We all read it, says Nicholas. Great. All right, so um, so we have a, a baseline recognition that the, 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 the perspective from which to perceive what's happening is at the level of a metacrisis. And I did not include a particular element in that conversation because it's not the kind of thinking that can be brought all the way to the highest level, but the best way of holding it is in fact a spiritual crisis. So we're actually right now in the process of working through a spiritual crisis at all fractal levels of identity. Um, of, of which the objective piece is showing up enormously. Um, but we can make it very practical. Um, already, and ex in an accelerating basis, the physical health crisis is cascading into a mental health crisis. And we're going to begin seeing that more and more as more and more people are actually forced to simply get out of their comfort zone, oftentimes in a very rapid and intense way, and then be put into things that they simply aren't prepared to be put into. Um, in addition, the real circumstances of life are actually changing rapidly. And for many people, they are act actually in some deep sense, A, powerless, um, and B, their best interests aren't in fact being well served. So I'll give you an example. If we zoom in on the economic subdomain of the metacrisis um, in the US, and that's a pretty good bellwether of ROW in this case, we had a, a level of unemployment uh, that, how do I say it? Well, it's actually shocking, it's, it's astounding. Um, as of yesterday, Goldman Sachs indicated that 2.5 million Americans will be <clears throat> applying for unemployment this week. So in one week, 2.5 million. That's something like, a sizable fraction of the total number of people who ended up going into unemployment during the financial crisis. It's 10 times the peak of any given period of time in the financial crisis. Uh, sorry, eight times the peak. And this is just the first week. Okay. Now the point of that is, it's like a big wave. Right? So we've got all of these different systems and each of the systems has a certain level of resilience, which of course has been moved into a pretty high level of fragility. Um, and the primary characteristic of the phenomenon that we're witnessing right now is a singular level of velocity, complexity, and magnitude in a short period of time. Right? The thing about the virus is not necessarily that it's a um, really, really bad sickness. The thing about the virus is because of its characteristics, it ramps very rapidly. And by the time we know that, it, that it's actually real, it's so big that it hits us hard and it overwhelms, for example, the medical system. So it's these big waves coming through and hitting systems 
faster than they can react with a magnitude that's well beyond their capacity, then they break and that then spreads contagion outward into other elements of the metasystem. So in this case, um, all at once, nobody is at work. And all at once, for example, um, if you look at the system fragility, uh, Bridgewater just put out an analysis that they think in the U.S. Uh, $4.5 trillion of earnings will be lost by uh, public companies over the period of the next two months, which is a lot, a, a really astounding amount of, of earnings. But that's just public companies. And if you look at the impact on public companies, there are some of those public companies that are going to break, meaning that they don't have the earnings capacity, they don't have the ability to reduce costs, they don't have the bank account to absorb the amount of reduction in earnings they're going to have, and they'll just break. And that will, of course, then bang into directions. It'll bang sideways into, for example, their employees, who will either be laid off to help the company survive or will be laid off because the company didn't survive. And it will go up into the political environment. But Goldman Sachs and Bridgewater, so far at least, haven't said anything about the people in the middle class, which is where the wave is actually hitting the hardest because it's where the fragility is the highest. Uh, you know, restaurants and Pilates studios and nail salons and hair salons and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, all over the world are really shut down and they rarely have a million dollars on the balance sheet to weather the storm. And they don't have lobbyists um, and they don't have public company metrics to show that they need to be bailed out. And there's an any real mechanism to bail them out. So without any real malintent and to be sure, in situations like this, there are also groups that are operating with malintent. Um, but without any real malintent, the choice-making infrastructure and the sense-making infrastructure to perceive what is really happening is, well, let's use Verveke's language. It has a salience landscape that is not mapped to the relevance realization. So we're going to be perceiving things like, oh no, the stock market is crashing and Fortune 1000 companies need to be bailed out because we can perceive it. We have an infrastructure that has capacity to perceive it, particularly our choice-making infrastructure has that capacity. They will then be scrambling like crazy to figure out how to engineer solutions to address that problem, which is, let's say, for example, a meaningful problem. Well, this will come at two costs. One cost is they then won't be allocating their scarce attention to what may be a vastly more relevant problem, which is small businesses and people, just people. And two, the solutions that they design are quite likely to throw externalities into that domain because they're A, not schooled in complex systems, and B, again, they've got blind spots in that environment. So that's kind of driving right into the middle of it, but I thought in this particular group it would be useful to drive, drive right into the middle of it and then to begin to work out from there because, well, we are all of us in that spot. I don't think any of us right now are CEOs of Fortune 1000 companies or Know, heads of state. Um, so we are in a position of saying, okay, how do we respond to that reality? How do we respond to the reality that the sense-making capacity of our governance institutions and their choice-making capacity is likely to throw a lot of errors? They're going to be operating from a lot of bad perception, and they're going to be creating solutions that lack the right level of design sensitivity and because of the bad perception, we'll be throwing externalities into places that they just don't even necessarily notice until it's too late, until something in their perception actually kicks up. Okay, great. That's the thing. And I think, I hope that this was clear in our diagnosis of the, of the blue church and of game A in general. This is just a, a known problem with the underlying, how would I say, topology, the underlying methodology of sense making and choice making that was built up in the mid century. So it's not a surprise, but now we're, of course, dealing with it as a practical element. So that's one side. So then it's the other side. And let's, in some sense, just use the language that I've been using the game A, game A, game B language. What's the situational assessment from the point of view of game B? And I think one of the big things that's happening right now is. Um, a significant acceleration of that particular developmental process. You know, uh, 
punctuated equilibrium is a fundamental characteristic of evolutionary dynamics. And as it turns out also largely of developmental dynamics. And you, you go through a lot of loops experimenting in liminal space until you've built the right kind of sensitivity to the holistics of the environment that you're in. Then you go through a very rapid transition of synthesizing that into a new competence. Then you're in a new competence and then you level up. That's kind of the process of development. And it happens in evolutionary systems as well, but in a slightly different way. So there's a kind of a breathing in right now of the field of game B. And, I, and, in, and here I think it's, a, it's important for me to indicate that the, that which calls itself game B isn't game B. Right? This has nothing to do with anyone who has self-identified with or is, or even is aware of the phrase or term. It has to do with the, the transcendental operator, the spiritual practice of having already come to a capacity of endeavoring to be able to perceive reality and to respond to it with increasing capacity, elegance, and good faith. Anyone anywhere who has done that on their own is what I'm referring to as game B. And then as that particular cohort uses the kairos of the moment to upgrade their individual and collective capacity, which is to say finding each other, with each other building trust, and now learning in the context of a real world experiment where choices matter, how to actually do this thing better. Um, you know, kind of moving through early adolescence. I would say right now, I think I've mentioned in the past that Game B was somewhere in late childhood and right, right now entering into the, the early teenage years, as far as I can tell. And so one of the big questions is how rapid does development actually happen in these environments? I'll give you a concrete example. Over the past three days, I believe that I have created, I've personally created 90 new high quality edges. Right, so think of a graph um, and there's nodes, which are us for each individual nodes. And if we have a relationship, it's an edge. You can have it imagine it's like a really dark line if it's a really good relationship and a really thin line if it's a, a small acquaintance and an awareness of the reality of the existence of the relationship. At a, at a graph theoretic level, the problem statement of game B is creating the right network topology, which is to say creating the right relationships with the right bindings, meaning the right um, strengths in the places where they need to be. In the past three days, I have created 90 edges. Right? These are relationships that up until three days ago, people who didn't know each other at all, or at least didn't have any direct relationship. They may have been aware of each other in sort of reputation. And using my discernment, and by the way, the discernment of the much larger network around me, it is strongly sensed that those are very, very valuable relationships to have. So the network topology of the graph around me has become enormously stronger because each one of these individuals are in fact themselves connected to large communities. And those communities are oriented by discernment and sovereignty. They are competent people who have been doing this kind of stuff. And we're getting better at knowing what competence means in this environment, which I think is a key question. So if we have questions around that, let's talk about it. All right, I think that's probably enough from the sort of spew point of view. So where's the best branching point to take this? Yeah, uh, so I'll ask you uh, maybe one or two questions, Jordan, but if anyone has questions, uh, just write it in the chat box and then I'll call on you. Um, so one question is, uh, I'm talking to a lot of people and a lot of people are confused about how to sense make and choice make in this environment. Um, and a lot of people are just addicted to like Twitter right now and just kind of intaking as much information. Um, and, and it seems unhealthy. A lot of people have been telling me. Um, so do you have any general practical like advice, tips, heuristics on uh, how to essentially put the ox oxygen mask on first? Yes. Um, and uh, let me make a meta point to be held um, because this is the this is the way this thing happens. Like why it works so well is that the the answer that I'm about to give has many many different synergies. So the first answer is to remember that sense making choice making always comes from sovereignty. So if you are not taking care of your sovereignty, 
you are by definition degrading your sense making and choice making. Right? So the first answer is begin at the beginning. You know, if you're not taking care of your sleep, your nutrition, your food, your physical exercise, and your, you know, whatever stoic, you know, Buddhist meditative yogic practice that you have, then do that. This is 101. And if you are not a tuned instrument prepared to engage in Wu Wei with the real flow of the, uh, the chaos, then nothing else that you do will land. Two, be mindful of addiction. Be aware of the fact, and I am first among those who have had this problem, so I'm not speaking from a higher place, I'm speaking from right in the middle of it. Um, I've had to be very careful to not let those little flashing red numbers, particularly in places where my mind, my ego mind, can tell me that it's very important to grab my attention. And so I've got, I don't know, 50 WhatsApp groups that I'm not part of that are actually doing things that I can convince myself are very important. And so I finish a particular conversation like this one, and my ego mind says, sit down at the laptop and look at WhatsApp. Oh my God, look at all those little circles with numbers on them. It's very important to whack that mole. Dopamine hit, you know, the salience landscaping <clears throat> that is designed or that has been optimized around by social media uh, is real and is, has a meaningful negative effect. So here's the protocol that I'm orienting towards. Above your personal self-care, your personal practices, allocate a significant amount of time to face-to-face -face conversation with other real humans. So bias in your media stack down towards higher bandwidth. Make that time. This is a good practice. Peer-to-peer, -peer, fucking just talk to people. People are, we're about to have a mental health crisis that is gonna make the viral crisis look like nothing happened. Um, begin the process of weaving a fabric of relationality that has at least something in the domain of humanness through these platforms. Go down into, into the embodiment layer. Dyadic conversations, triadic conversations, four, five, six. As you start getting past seven, it starts becoming less human. Right? This conversation is much more in the informational domain. It's harder for us to build relationality. If you have a community that actually has existing relationality, you can obviously get those numbers higher. But that's the key. Real relationships, real embodiment, real humanity still needs to be the majority of your sense-making time. And don't underestimate that. A lot of insight will come from conversations with just regular people, your friends. You'll learn things that, that help bring things together that you otherwise couldn't perceive by scanning the thin, fast, uh, salience landscape of what's happening in high-refresh social media. Daniel uh, Kazanjan, can you read out your question? Yeah, I was wondering, what are the standard operating procedures for engaging with people in the real world, given the necessity for social distancing? You, do you mean in the physical world? Yeah. Um, we don't actually have high quality protocols for that. Um, it is a project that's being worked on. Oddly enough, Brett Weinstein took that as a personal task. Um, so right now, the standard operating procedures are as little as you can get away with, and we're trying to evolve it from there. So the big work right now is to try to figure out, in parallel really, what can we do using a medium like this, because this is going to have to play a big role over the next couple of months, and then backing that back out, how do we create appropriate protocols for embodied, like real embodied physical interaction? Even simple shit like going to the grocery store and then ideally bigger stuff where we can actually be back in real relationship with each other. Ellie, can you unmute yourself and read your question? Yes, thank you. Um, my question was, I'll just read it. I'm responsible for three young children. How much effort should I be making to get them to higher ground? 
for example, I'm in Silicon Valley in Palo Alto uh, in a tiny apartment and uh, I have access to a farm, um, a family farm in, in Quebec. And we, I was thinking of driving. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll just put my, my sort of own skin in the game. I drove. Um, my wife and I took our young daughter and we took a road trip out to Texas and we're now sitting in our, uh, on our family, our family farm. <laughs> if you have access to a family and a family farm and you have three young children, my basic sense is that would be a very good idea. I don't know if you're going to be able to get across the border. We're all Canadian, so ah, they'll, let that, it, they'll let us do it. That, I'll, I'll tell my husband after this call. Thank you. Yeah, and, and this is like my, my, my wife gave me this feedback. So in my case, I, uh, <laughs> I pulled the trigger, gosh, almost four weeks ago. And so my sensors all went red and I said, okay, I'd like to, rec I'd like to suggest that we do something that seems a little weird. Uh, I'd like to buy a lot of food and water and materials and put it in the RV and drive to Texas. Um, and she just looked at me going, why? We've got, you know, lives. And that seems really hard. I said, why don't we, why don't we frame it as, as road trips are fun? Why don't we frame it as uh, camping is the thing we like to do? And as we move, perhaps things will become more obvious. And I think two days ago, she actually just pulled me aside and said, thank you because we couldn't possibly be in a better place. Um, and we would be insane right now in our, you know, our little ranch house in San Diego with the inability to actually bring in any other people. So it would just be the two of us trying to deal with, uh, with an 18 month old. Um, and that's not three young children, that's one. So, yeah. But you know, my stomach is like feeling very, uh, almost like tender right now. Because that's a real, that's a serious question. That's a really, really hard choice to make. Um, my brother-in-law actually asked me yesterday, um, his girlfriend, they actually moved into our house. So they, were, they live in San Diego. Um, they were in a tiny, tiny apartment. They moved into our house. Um, but his girlfriend's Canadian. And he said, what should I do? Because if she gets sick, she has no insurance here in America. And we can't afford to deal with any medical costs. Should she go back to Canada? And if she does, she, she has aged elderly parents who have uh, both have compromised uh, pulmonary systems. And so all I could do is say, okay, here's the information that I have. Here's the choices that you've made in the past. You're going to have to make the best choice and, and try to feel good about the, your capacity in making good choices. Like that's kind of where we are right now. All right. Greg, did you have a question, uh, Greg Walsh, to piggyback on that? Hello. Yeah, uh, this was just in relation to Ellie's question that uh, I, I do have access to a family farm way up in the boons of uh, Pennsylvania, but it's completely off grid. Well, not completely, but there's no internet access, no communication, no cell phone. So uh, is it do I think about it as better to stay in the area where I can have access to things like this or, you know, go someplace more to hunker down? Well, again, um, I think, I think questions like this would probably best be feel, fielded in a collaborative collective intelligence. But I can guarantee you that the specifics matter and I don't have any good answers. When I listen to what you're saying, I would actually feel very, um, I would feel very concerned personally if I didn't have access to communications. Um, it's kind of a, it's a long bet. Now, you know, so as I think through it, I'm like, okay, well, to what degree does it have significant sufficiency? Does it have good water? Does it have good food? Like, is it really a hunker down place? Because in this case, you'd be looking to hunker down in a very big way. Um, second part is, what role do you have to play in the larger conversation? Like, we may need you. And so while it may, in fact, in some sense, in principle, even be in your best interest to go off grid, it may not be in the best interest of the whole. So think in both directions. Um, and then it, there's a context of family. Um, young children or vulnerable people, uh, there's a need, a real priority of getting in, them into places which are more livable in the context of, of what looks like several months at least of hunkering down. 
um, I mean, young, fit, able-bodied males, which is kind of in a wartime footing, um, if you have something to give to the larger context, um, it may be the most, the best choice to be thinking about prioritizing that. So it's, you know, these are very complex, nuanced questions. And um, that's my sense. And by the way, my sense may not necessarily be a good sense. <laughs> it's just, uh, you know, what I got. Now, Ryan, uh, would you like to read out your question? Yeah, um, one of the things that I'm feeling these days, um, my situation is actually pretty stable. Um, we've got enough amenities around us, uh, social distancing pretty easily, um, but I'm being filled with a sense of urgency and almost a calling to actually uh, participate more and actually take advantage of this leverage point in history. Um, I'm curious what you're seeing from your perspective for a person who is in a good position, what are some particularly high leverage um, actions that you um, are seeing right now that might be, become important on, the, on a larger scale? <laughs> well, that's actually a very long list. Uh, so let me see if I can find a way to, to create a, uh, an impeccable answer. Um, all right. I'm going to do this at a high level and then try to bring it down to a more practical level. For those of you who can track it at the high level, it will be the maximally leveraged. And if not, we'll bring it down into more practical levels in Wickens land. At a high level, the world right now is basically being broke, broken up into roughly four kinds of people. The first kind, still the vast majority, are people who are not yet secure. Um, in many cases, that security is at the psychological level. They have not yet adjusted to the reality of where we are and are moving into a place of psychological cognitive sovereignty. And in many cases, it's physical. Uh, they are still in places where there's a real question of whether or not it's a good place for them to be. So category one, and in category one, the only thing is to get yourself into a place of stability. In some sense, that's simple and of course, really, really hard. Then you've got people who have, have moved across, they've figured out what the right answer is and they're moving through that process. And then you've got people in category two. People in category two are people who are now trying to, asking a question like what you're asking. I am now stable and I'm looking around trying to understand how do I best be of service in the context of the larger whole. Um, and category two are people who are, are positioned to operate in what I would call tactical or engaged mode. They're, they're on the ground doing stuff. Um, you know, projects swarming all over the place depending on your local capacities and your relationships. Right? Your relationships matter here. People who you know and trust, like finding people you know and trust and self-organizing with them because leveraging a collective intelligence just has such a multiplier effect. Um, and it's really easier to work with people who you already know and trust and find out what you as a group can do than it is to try to jump into something where you have to, to build relationality, unless you have very unique skills. And if you have very unique skills, then finding a place where your very unique skills are uniquely well-serviced, um, it's worth the time and energy to build relationality. But broadly speaking, um, self-organizing groups that you feel good relationship with and saying, okay, what can we do is a first, is the best answer. Because at the high level, the question is we. Right? The big challenge for us right now is to avoid the us versus them dynamic and continue to embody and grow the we dynamic. Um, that's kind of a good aesthetic rule of thumb. Okay, third category. The third category are people who are equipped to operate at a level of strategic leverage. And unfortunately, most of the people who are operate to operate in the third category don't have the best interest of the whole at mind. So these are collective intelligences, often organizations and political groups, pick your favorite bad guy, um, who have already in some sense adjusted to the current reality, have seen that we're in a Kairos event, and have a capacity to not be mired in trying to fight fires, but to sit back and look at the environment and say, okay, what are the moves that I can make that have the most strategic leverage? Um, I'll give you an example. Right now, 
the Treasury Department is endeavoring to put together a program to inject substantial amounts of cash directly into individuals. We're talking about like $1,000 per person. That won't be enough, but in any event, bad idea. And you can imagine, by the way, that's an intense thing, like to take that idea and move it from you know, Andrew Yang to going to happen as moving through a lot of uh, inertia, like psychological inertia. And so they're, they're very much focused, almost all focused tactically. How do we make it happen? What's a plan that kind of works? But there's a handful of folks who are well positioned to look at it strategically, meaning they're watching the whole environment saying, how do I nudge this system to maximally take advantage of the fact that this is a huge program. There's gonna be several trillion dollars of money are going to be moved into the environment. Now, if you happen to be in a place where you can move strategically, you can make that shape move in a direction that benefits the things you wanna benefit, that's high leverage. Unfortunately, again, most of the guys in category four are not working in the best interest of the whole. Um, and, and so if you have that kind of capacity, forming collective intelligences that have, a gen, have an OODA loop that can operate strategically, meaning they can perceive, sense make, and then choice make and actuate um, in the pace and complexity of the environment they're operating in, and have the best interest of the whole in mind, do that. Don't worry about things in category two, operate at category three. Um, and there are examples of that. So I'll give you an example right now. Um, we're trying to nudge places like say Facebook to move into a higher level of um, effective choice, more ethical approaches, because if they can begin to drop into more ethical approaches, the power of the platform is quite high. And by the way, I'm, and we, and I, again, when I say category three, I don't necessarily mean malintent. I just mean that their egoic structures are driving their choice making. So they cannot help but make choices that are maximizing their rival risk game theoretic position because that's the way they make sense of the world. Then you have people in category four. Category four is the ability to have the conversation we're having right now. The ability to actually perceive the meta landscape that includes all the previous categories and to be able to contemplate what might it look like in principle to have an OODA loop, to have sovereignty, to have a sense-making, perception sense-making, choice-making and actuation capacity in that context. How might we go about constructing a collective intelligence with enough strength, with a binding capacity, with a, an ability to move things through it fast enough and rich enough to perceive everything that's happening and to make effective choices in that context and then to percolate those effective choices down into the actuation dynamics of the real world so as to maximally nudge the total system dynamics in an upgrading for the whole. If you understood right, what I said right there, welcome to category four. Um, it's not a common place to be, but it can become very common if people are listening in the right way. It's a, uh, Uh, the only language we have to describe it is something a transcendent or a spiritual dimension, maximally using your cognitive and embodied capacities to communicate and perceive. Right? It's, it's the real omega point. <laughs> there are some that are proposing a category five. If there is such a thing, it's above my pay grade. Okay, I'm gonna read out uh, Ashley's question. I'm in education, high school and college students. What conversational topics can I engage them with without scaring them, but planting seeds and hopefully sculpting them into sovereign ally aware beings and or emerging leaders? I believe it is my duty to start conversations with my sphere. I don't know who you are, but I love you. Um, that is one of the most, what do you call it? Ripe and ripe in, in, in this full aesthetic sense, which is to say that, uh, as time moves forward, it begins to move into overripe and then into rottenness, meaning this is something where moving with smoothness and elegance to take advantage of the opportunity that's emerging in a timely fashion to avoid it actually becoming something that's a real problem is calistos. Um, and there are many, many answers to that question. The most powerful answer is to recognize 
that these kids are superheroes waiting to happen. Their native ambient capacity to flow across the possibility space of the environment that we live in right now at the physical level is orders of magnitude greater than our own. If we can find a way to empower them to recognize that they have within themselves most of what is needed, if they can learn how to communicate with each other and connect and connect with the, the, the people who want to help them help themselves, they will become the most powerful force in the world. And I don't mean that in the least bit, um, how do I say this, naively. Benjamin Franklin was doing some serious shit when he was 12. Right? If there are 12 year olds right now who could do some serious shit. There are definitely 17 year olds and 22 year olds who could do some serious shit. Um, and in many cases, if we can help them, that's the best thing. And of course, to the degree to which they learn through doing by embodied capacity to achieve self liberation and self sovereignty, then my God, that's very powerful. So to the degree to which you can actually create in yourself the capacity to be a conduit for wisdom and flow that into them and help them unlock within themselves the ambient capacity to step into their own sovereignty and discover the ways themselves that work to support each other, that is your highest. That would be the most valuable thing that could be done. Um, and there are so many. They're all sitting at home playing Minecraft if they uh, are kind of in the high school trend. Well, Minecraft is exactly one half a step away from doing real stuff. If they're sitting at home watching Netflix, make them aware of how addiction works and recognize that very soon that's going to be very bad for their health. Thomas, uh, you had a few questions. One recently about the earthquake that happened in Utah. Hey, thanks. Um, yeah, just... Um, wondering about secondary effects and if, uh, um, if any other natural disasters, you know, came onto the scene, earthquakes, hurricanes, um, you know, coming into hurricane season at the end of the summer, um, you know, how that might affect the, the larger sphere, the political sphere, the economic sphere, and, and also just back home. I mean, stocking up on resources, not a bad thing, but um, challenging to do person to person contact. Um, in that scenario of direct aid for people who are hit most worst. Yeah. Um, well, <laughs> uh, first pray. Um, let, let's hope that has some efficacy because it would be really nice not to have any significant natural disasters in the middle of this because obviously we're stressed to the limits. And as you say, am I still active? Sorry, Thomas just froze. Was it me? We're good. Okay. Um, the normal way that we respond to most natural disasters um, is uniquely inhibited by the context that we find ourselves in. A whole bunch of people getting together to start putting sand in sandbags to prevent the levee from breaking um, is going to be hard. That said, some things are more acute than other things. Right? If you're right now in the context of being flooded, you're going to have to rapidly figure out a way to quarantine the people who actually need to be protected and then put able-bodied people on the front lines to actually deal with that problem and then figure out how to deal with the rest later. Sorry, that's just reality. Um, but let's take it up one level and look at the meta-reality. Uh, Daniel Schmachtenberger you know, brought this to the collective intention. Um, people like first responders, like think, think about medical, uh, EMS, and even like military as we start moving closer and closer to having the need to actually start using national guard to to maintain order and quarantine um, they're not wearing hazmat suits and what that means simultaneously is that they're going to get infected and act as vectors for for dissemination and they're going to get sick so we just kind of need to be mindful of that at a certain level it doesn't matter at a certain level it's problematic and at a certain level it creates another cascade effect to deal with so yes spillover effects both natural and non-natural that inject asymmetric anti-modal chaos into the system will be challenging to deal with what i mean by that is an earthquake is a nature-driven anti-modal it's a new front it's a new kind of thing that we are currently dealing with um, and it's chaotic it means that it creates a whole new crisis for horizon and our ways of dealing with crisis horizons in general are stretched to the limit and in ways that we're not even used to. Human-driven, 
would be if some um, nice person decides to say do a cyber attack on smart grids tomorrow. Um, we're hyper vulnerable to all kinds of malintent and we're hyper vulnerable to all kinds of natural disaster. But let's flip it around. We're not just helpless. Uh, the fact that the entire populace right now is moving into a resilience mindset means that we can actually handle more crisis. What would otherwise have been, I remember actually, and I think this was actually lost to the collective intelligence. In September 11th, in that crisis event, not too long after, like six days after, if I recall correctly, there was like a jumbo jet that crashed in New York, New Jersey, kind of on the East Coast. But we were all so super saturated with events that were going on that what I had, would otherwise have owned our salience landscaping went almost unnoticed. And I don't mean that, and that's always, that's negative in some sense, because maybe it did need to go unnoticed, but also positive. If we are now geared up and dealing with serious firefighting, adding another fire to the equation is hard, but it's also something we may in fact be positioned to deal with. So let's think about it like our job right now is to build the capacity to respond to whatever nature and humanity throws at us. And then let's hope that it throws things at us that are not too hard to deal with. Thank you. Okay. Sorry, let me just let me hit that really quick. So but Thomas, the point message there is we just need to be able to respond to reality when it shows up. So it's, it's point by point. If you've got an earthquake, use the collective intelligences that are developing to figure out how to create a bespoke solution to the situation that you find yourself in. That's kind of it. Yeah, makes sense. Okay, um, we've got about 10 more minutes left. It looks like the collective intelligence is doing its work in the chat. Um, so I'll read this one. explosion in time, huh? <laughs> so I'll read um, a question from our buddy, Phil Chen. Uh, how do you see SOCHI, uh, Social Organizing and Collective Intelligence, evolve after coronavirus? How do we use, sustain this energy after this and not go back to normal? Yeah, um, and this is kind of one of those, the water comes, the tide comes in, the tide comes out, alluvial plane things, where as it comes in, lots and lots of things can happen. And then as it comes out, certain portions of what's developed now will in fact wash out. And the challenge is going to be, how do we maximally move things up the hierarchical complexity developmental landscape, which is to say, um, there are in fact stage developments. There are things where once you've actually learned it, it's just now part of reality. It doesn't get unlearned, even when the pressure lowers. Um, relationships that are built, real relationships that are built on in the trenches don't go away. Think about that metaphor of, of World War II. The people who went and fought in World War II and built real relationships, when they came back to peacetime, they still had real relationships. And so when things were tough, you could get on the phone and call your buddy in New York and say, hey, remember me? And they're like, yeah, I remember you. You were next to me in the, in the, in the foxhole. I need some help. And help happened because you're operating from a transcendent relationship. That's one. So again, if we can move the stack down into building that kind of fabric, that kind of fabric doesn't go away. Second, habits, like building better intuitions on how to do this kind of thing. Right now, people are forced out of the inertia of their time being spent doing other stuff. It's a found opportunity. Either we can't do it because that environment doesn't exist anymore, or the energy of the moment is actually pushing us past minimum thresholds of not being lazy and actually learning new skills. All right, well, as fast as possible, like take that seriously, learn new skills, like really learn how to build a capacity, your capacities of discernment. Really learn how to build more conceptual landscapes and build the interior of your psychoscape so you're actually able to perceive what's going on better. Physical infrastructure. There are tools being built. Those tools more or less don't necessarily need to go away. If they're really good tools, they won't go away. Um, it doesn't necessarily need, mean, by the way, that that's where all the attention needs to go. Those first two layers are more important. They're more fundamental. They're more the way that self-organizing collective intelligence actually operates. Because a lot of physical inf infrastructure is going to be thrown together to meet the needs of the moment, as it should be. So it's more like seeing the topology of that infrastructure, seeing what kinds of things work. And then saying, okay, how do we build on top of that? But on occasion, some pieces might actually just be permanent upgrades of our collective capacity. Um, okay. 
So this one's from Adam, this is interesting. Um, wide networks of artists, musicians, creative practitioners, normally focused on long-term shifts in thinking, opening new spaces, best way for their faculty, best way for those faculties to contribute in the current context. Yeah, so let's just kind of hammer on that notion of the transcendent operator. Um, like I said at the beginning, this is a spiritual crisis and the deepest best work is actually done at the spiritual level. If you can find a way to actually synthesize collectively, if our collective soul can hear that which is calling to change within us, and then you can communicate that so that everyone is actually feeling that thing resonating within themselves and give it voice so that they in themselves can actually feel the light coming through themselves and grow from their interior, that is the highest possibility for the whole. That is the job of the artists now. Nate, uh, you had a question? Or Jake, I should say, Jake, about network, the collective intelligence. Yeah, thanks. So uh, it seems like uh, network collective intelligence as a mode of making sense of things and orienting yourself because it was so effective and kind of ahead of the curve of, of um, the kind of centralized sense making organs for this crisis has demonstrated legitimacy to the broader public. And so I suspect that, that more and more people will be moving toward using that as their, their primary mode of sense making, especially since they're gonna be um, digital as well. Um, but, but there are obviously dynamics of social contagion and, and panic that, that crowds orient toward. And I'm wondering what you think the, the best way to mitigate that is as a broader populace that isn't necessarily sovereign moves toward that mode of sense making. People learn most through emulation and they most learn best through emulation of other people who they feel sense, not feel feel are like them. So the more diverse people that we can bring into conversations like this one that can be seen and perceived by other people, the better. That's the maximum bandwidth channel for disseminating um, right action. So for example, campfires. And by the way, I need to brand this Brett's campfire because Brett's the one who gave me this idea. Like this. Let us show people what it means to be asking the right kinds of questions and thinking from a place of sovereignty and uh, compassion. What it looks like, it feels like. It's the feeling factor that matters most. If they can feel it in their body, what it feels like to be able to be truly sovereign in the context of now, and then can feel, can start to make choices to begin engaging. Like the first step is watch one. The second step is do one, right? Watch, learn, do. And we can iterate on that. A widely distributed network of people who are participating in decentralized campfires that are upgrading our collective capacity to actually be conscious is very doable and very powerful. And it's very, in some sense, very easy because everybody can do it. From that comes the next set of stuff. So imagine in those campfires, people begin inquiring into these kinds of questions and learning how to ask the best questions and learning how to respond to them in the right way. Okay, um, so this is gonna be the last question. Sorry for those uh, questions we didn't get to. Um, and Joe, I'm gonna read this on your behalf. Uh, what does prayer look like in a game B world? <laughs> oh, that's a good question. Oddly enough, I was actually just wondering that myself. Um, like literally as you were asking the questions, so that's a good sign. Uh, the conversation I've been having with John around faith, I think, points in more or less in the right direction. Right? It does not look like uh, magical thinking. What's it look like? Well, let's just do it in first person. This is what it looks like for me. Um, it begins with meditation. It's that bottom of the U thing. If you guys are familiar with that metaphor. So slowing down, knowing that the first thing to do is actually to get out of the egoic construct. So slowing down, loosening, relaxing, settling, getting to the bottom of the U. Then from the bottom of the U, listening to what is calling. And it's not a egoic construct projecting wants into the world. It's a self listening to what the world is asking for. And then feelings, allowing the feelings to emerge. The world communicates through feelings and noticing what those feelings are. 
and orienting more and more into a directionality of, I suppose we might call them virtue, calling in yourself grace, humility, compassion, hope, and hope again. We can, we can rescue these ideas. We can, we can put them in the right, on the right footing. I don't know if you've watched that video. If you haven't watched that video, we, we did a lot of good stuff around these kinds of words. Dispositionally orienting your higher self into the right kinds of um, ways of being to be able to most fully perceive in the, without getting in the way, without having prejudgment and fear and um, all those other kinds of things, bending what it is you're perceiving. That's actually what prayer looks like. Doesn't that seem interesting? It's a very different kind of notion, right? You're not trying to send emails to God. That ain't it. Um, it's more like learning how to become capable and asking for the capacity to give your highest into what is needed in the moment for the whole. It is the daemon. Um, so we have a session coming up on, uh, let's see, that I'm doing on the 23rd at 7 p.m. Eastern time, embodying the Stockdale paradox. And that's like a stoic term for holding the tension between like that radical uncertainty in the, and seeing the grittiness of reality, but at the same time having this uh, existential hope at the, at the same time. So if you're interested for that session, uh, you can RSVP to it. Um, so Jordan, uh, any closing thoughts? Well, yeah, I don't think I even want to go high level on this. Let me stick with that one piece because I think that there's a that learning, like the edge, that question, the practice of actually getting in, into that place is a hyper useful practice. Um, and it's very scalable because a lot of people are confused. How do you become capable of actually smoothly being in connection with the shape of the reality that you're in? Like that's the thing. Um, the fear is a signal. Don't avoid it, listen to it, but don't let it make you tight, like that kind of stuff, like those kinds of practices and building those practices so we can actually just become capable of following Bruce Lee, you know, being water in the context of what is happening. Hmm. Okay, so I'm gonna make an announcement in a moment, but thank you, Jordan, for um, being on this call today and being such a mensch during this meta crisis. <laughs> you're welcome <laughs> um, bye guys see you Jordan uh, so for everyone else uh, tomorrow 11 a.m. Eastern time we have Massimo Piglucci discussing uh, being a stoic during a pandemic other upcoming events include care mongering meditations uh, existential dance parties uh, you can check this all out on the stoa.ca to RSVP to them uh, I'll include it in the, the chat in a moment there we go. Um, you can sign up to the mailing list there. And um, I view the STOA as a gift for everyone to freely use. And if you're inspired to provide a gift in return, you can go to the website uh, and you can see the gift economy below. So thanks everyone for being on the call today. Appreciate it. Bye guys. Thank you, Peter.